So in this third part of population ecology, we're going to look at another mathematical representation of how populations can be described. And these are going to be in survivorship curves. What these are going to do is to show graphic representations of what percentage or what portion of a population you would expect to be alive of each given age. And these are going to enable biologists ecologists or sometimes insurance agents in the human world to predict the likelihood of whether somebody is going to live or die at a given age. And again, the life tables are especially used in economic settings such as with insurance companies. So as we look at a survivorship curve here, we see that there are two different type, sorry, three different types of lines. You have your type one survivorship, and that's defined by the line above the purple a shaded section. You can see this is typical of organisms like the giant tortoise where they have a high likelihood of surviving until quite an old age and then they die rather precipitously once they reach a very high age. But if you see a young tortoise one would expect that it would survive according to the type 1 survivorship curve. Whereas with a type 2 survivorship curve such as a lot of the songbirds at any given age, they're essentially just as likely to die as at any other age. As they get older, you'd expect to see fewer and fewer of them, but the rate at which they would be expected to expire does not change much throughout their lifespan. And with a type 3 survivorship curve, which is the line above the green shaded section, we would see that it is extremely likely that young individuals would die, as you can tell from the high level of the high sharp negative slope of that beginning of the green line. But should they survive to a medium age, then you would expect that they would live for a long time. So a rapid early mortality, but if they survive that, then they'll ex likely live for a long time. These are three different types of survivorship curves. So what would you expect for humans? Pause it, and when you have your answer, advance the video. You can see we're likely to be type 1. We don't have a very high, especially in a first world country, uh, you would expect that infants will survive and a person would not be likely to pass away until they were older or later in life. Now, of course, there are trade-offs between reproduction and longevity. And generally, organisms have to have one or the other. They can either reproduce in vast quantities or very often, or they can live for a long time. You don't tend to have organisms, especially in the animal kingdom, that both reproduce large quantities and frequently and have a long life expectancy. This is an evolutionary trade-off and natural selection will favor one or the other but not both. And so three areas are going to tend to be differentially selected for either growth, reproduction, or survival. And whenever you increase one area you will tend to select against another area. So let's look at some of these examples. So we have reproduction versus survival. And in the case of salmon, they will tend to be selected for reproduction over survival. They will have massive bouts of reproduction. They will swim upstream and you know, brave the hazards of the environment and risk getting eaten by bears to spawn. They'll have the, the opportunity to lay thousands of eggs, but then they die. So lot of reproduction, short survival. Reproduction versus growth. Either you can grow a lot yourself, invest your energy in your own growth, or you can spend that energy on reproduction and have many offspring. This is typical in the plant kingdom and generally in years like you can see year eight the tree grew quite a bit. It has a very thick growth ring. This was a time when investment was going towards growth and in some years investment and energy would go towards reproduction and 
in the years when reproduction was high, you would expect that those are going to coincide with years of more limited growth, like years 9, 10, and 11. Another trade-off is the number of offspring versus the size of the offspring. In the same way that an organism cannot reproduce and grow and live for a long time all at the same time, they cannot both have a large number of offspring and have a large size offspring. There has to be a trade-off. In the reptile world, generally, eggs that are very small are unlikely to survive to be hatched. Eggs that are very large are much more likely to live to hatch, but the organism cannot have as many large eggs, and so the likelihood of an offspring surviving until reproductive age is lower, and this forces a directional, sorry, a stabilizing shift towards a medium-sized egg. And you can see with the lizard down there that all of the eggs are approximately the same size. None of them are very small and none of them are very large. And human birth weight works the same way. Very, very tiny babies are selected against because they tend not to survive. Very, very large babies are also selected against because while they might be born healthy, they might not be born at all, especially a long time ago because the mother would not likely survive childbirth. So we have this stabilizing selection of a medium-sized child, often somewhere between seven and nine pounds. So which ones do you think that humans use? And think about how you would justify this answer. So why do organisms age is another question. And the ecological influence of aging is something that is also going to be selected for or against. So we have elephants age very, very slowly. They will live to be quite old, often into their 50s or 60s in the wild. And so they, like humans, tend to have age-related diseases far more likely at older ages than at younger ages. And we all know that there's a physical decline over the years, and so aging can in one way be defined as an increased risk of dying. And we can see the skin slackening, osteoporosis, a little bit of a hunch setting in, oftentimes metabolism changes. Why did these things happen, and why did they happen when we're old rather than when we're young? What is selecting against young aging? And we can see that many genetic diseases will affect older people and not younger people. And it makes a lot of sense if you look at this in a selective framework. If an infant is born with a mutation that's going to lead to a genetic disease, that is severe and that has its onset prior to sexual maturation, that individual will die before he or she can reproduce and the trait will not get passed along. Whereas an infant that's born with a genetic disorder that might cause age, this says at 150, but let's say just at age 40, it is very likely in a human population that somebody will have already re reproduced by age 40, and so whatever genetic disorder they have has already been passed along to the offspring prior to it becoming a problem, and so it cannot be selected against. If you remember from Bio 101, traits that occur after reproduction cannot be selected against, only ones that will affect the individual prior to reproduction. And so genetic disorders such as increased risk of cancer, increased risk of heart attack, increased risk of lung disorders, any of these that have a late onset can be carried and passed on to the next generation because they will not affect the individual until after the age of reproduction. But 
if the disorder has an onset prior to reproductive years, say before an individual turns 12, then that can be cleaned out or weeded out of the gene pool because those individuals will never pass it on to the next generation. And so which one cannot be influenced by natural selection? Pause the video and then advance when you are ready. And of course, lifespan after reproduction is something that cannot be influenced because you will have already reproduced before knowing how long you're going to live. And feeding into this beyond just your own genetic setting is the predation hazard factors that an organism is going to face. And these force natural selection to favor one type of reproductive style over another. So we mentioned before that rodents will start breeding at about one month of age. They will tend to have a litter of six to ten pups every month. So they only live for a short period of time, but during that time they age and sexually mature rapidly and reproduce both at a young age and frequently. They have a high hazard factor because, gosh, you know, what can't eat them? Snakes can eat them, cats can eat them, birds can eat them, everything can eat them, so they have a very high hazard factor. Whereas tortoises have a very low hazard factor. Once they get close to adulthood, between the combination of their thick skin and their thick shell, it's very difficult for other organisms to eat them, and so they tend to live for a very long time but that also means that they tend to age rather slowly, which means they reach sexual maturity rather slowly and cannot reproduce until later in life and tend to have only one clutch of eggs in a year. And so with high risk factors, organisms are going to tend to die at a young age they're going to tend to reach sexual maturity early and they're going to reproduce early and often. But with low risks or low, a small number of predators, death from external sources is low, aging and matura uh, sexual maturation are slow, and they don't begin to reproduce until later in life and have less frequent and smaller which one you would expect to age more slowly if you were looking at them in a zoo? A porcupine or a guinea pig? High or low? Pause the video while you think about it and then start it again. And so hopefully you realize that a porcupine is going to have a smaller number of potential predators and thus will tend to age more slowly and reproduce more slowly if it is in captivity.